Today we're going to be talking about dungeons again, but unlike my previous video, which mostly focused on the rules that you might use for running a dungeon, today we're going to look at the principles, I guess you might say, for how to design a dungeon. This is going to be a top-down look at the things that you should be thinking about when you're laying out all of the rooms, the corridors, just the physical space that your players are going to be navigating. This video is probably going to be the first in a series of a couple of videos that I'm going to do on dungeon design, with ones later on focusing more on the things that you put into a dungeon. So stocking a dungeon, the types of NPCs that you put there, the sort of things that you need to think about to make a dungeon come alive. A lot of people object to dungeons in general because they feel very static. So the videos down the line are going to focus more on that aspect of it and making them a much more exciting, engaging place. If you want to stay up to date with this series that I'm making on Dungeon Design, remember to hit the subscribe and the bell icons down below. In addition, I'm doing another giveaway this week, this time for the book Tiny Dungeon 2nd Edition. So this is the fancy leatherette version of Tiny Dungeon, and if you stay around to the end of the video, I will show you how you can get your name in the running to win it. All right, principle number one is multiple entrances and exits. If you start your dungeon off with, this is the only way into the dungeon, then I feel like it sets the players up on the wrong foot uh, because it starts feeling a little bit like a railroad where you have a kind of curated experience that the players are going to have to go through. By adding multiple entrances around the area of the dungeon, you're starting the dungeon out with a number of choices. I would put a couple fairly obvious ways in and then maybe a few secret ones as well for players who are very observant and are looking closely. This really establishes the dungeon as an exploration space that the dungeon master has simply presented to the players and is allowing them to explore as they see fit. The entrances can link up to different areas of the dungeon, allowing for a different experience each time the players explore because they can go in a different way. It also allows players to be able to escape in more than one manner. And even further, if they come back to the dungeon over and over again, and they've already explored one area, they don't have to slog through it a second time. They can simply jump to another area and start from that point, perhaps eventually connecting up to where they were again. One fun trick is to add information to the dungeon entrance as to the kind of area that they will discover if they use that entrance as opposed to another. This makes the player's choices even more meaningful because by examining these different entrances, the kinds of carvings they might see there, the types of enemies perhaps guarding the door, they will again be able to choose the kind of fun that they want to have for that session. Second thing to think about when designing a dungeon is to really consider why it was built in the first place. Typically dungeons are these very ancient locations that were built by some ancient civilization or maybe a mad wizard a long, long time ago. Um, but whatever the reason was for it being built, that's going to inform the general layout that you're going to see there. For example, if the structure is in fact a dungeon, in other words, a prison of some sort designed to keep things in, then the general layout there is going to look very different than if it was in the distant past a fortress meant to keep things out. By envisioning its overall purpose, it's going to solve a lot of design problems because where the different rooms are going to go and how things are arranged is going to be sort of solved for you at the beginning, or at least there's going to be an internal logic there that's going to really speed along your process and make the dungeon have a more coherent feel overall. Number three is levels. So levels are, of course, a very classic element of the old school D&D mega dungeon. In fact, it's really one of those features that was co-opted by video games as time went on. You know how video games have the concept of getting to the next level, not just in character level, but getting to the next zone that you're going to fight some enemies in? That's taken from D&D dungeons. Now, originally, the reason why dungeons had these levels was because they represented gradations of danger. If you went to the second level of a dungeon, for example, that would roughly map out to being the right level of danger for a second level character, and so on and so forth. So as your character grew in levels, then you could get deeper and deeper into the dungeon and take greater risks with possibly more rewards attached. Now, your dungeon doesn't need to have actual literal levels going downward, although that is pretty common. But the general principle is that you want to have areas of the dungeon that are much more dangerous than other areas and have these zones very clearly signposted. This way, the players can really choose for themselves how much danger they want to put themselves in. There's a gambling aspect here that a lot of people find very fun. How far do I want to push myself? Do I want to take the risk to go into the really dangerous area and get as much loot as I can and then escape, hopefully with my life? Number four, and this one's really big, is have loops in your dungeon. By loops, I mean avoid making a dungeon very linear. And while we're at it, try avoiding a tree-like structure as well. A tree structure is when it's 
pretty much a linear dungeon, but with a bunch of dead end paths that radiate from it. Instead, what you want to try and create is a network of hallways and corridors and rooms that are all linked together in lots of different ways. This is going to allow players to explore in any direction that they want and feel like they are really uncovering a lost area that they weren't meant to find rather than just following along a set path created for them by the DM. Loops allow players to come back to where they were from more than one angle. They allow the players to uh, get stuck going one way and then find another way around to get to their objective. They allow players to circle back around enemies and attack them from behind. There's a lot of tactical and strategic things that simply open up when you have this network or interconnected structure for your dungeon rather than a simple linear path or a tree branching structure. Dungeons that have this feature are frequently referred to as highly Jaquaid dungeons, named after Janelle Jaquay, who was a, a designer at TSR back in the day and whose dungeons frequently had this uh, structure to them. I'm going to link a blog post down in the description below called Jaquaying the Dungeon, which is a real classic on the topic and is a really interesting read if you want to get more into this topic. Number five, and this one is pretty frequently ignored in dungeon design, is having a lot of verticality. Dungeons are often thought of as being two-dimensional spaces, seeing as they're often drawn on graph paper. But by adding a lot more three-dimensionality to your dungeons, you add a whole new possibility space for PCs to interact with. Examples of this might include things like very tall rooms, perhaps with galleries so that players can look down on things happening below, rappel down, climb up, and so on. You can add connections between levels, mine shafts, and so on. You can even add ways that players can get the drop on enemies or enemies can get the drop on players. It simply adds another direction for them to have to look in, which players often don't think about doing. So once you really start reinforcing that danger can come from any direction, players get much more interested in their surroundings. It also makes mapping a lot more difficult and simultaneously a lot more fun. Players often have a great time discovering that they can get to a location that they were trying to get to by going up and over rather than simply trying to push through. Number six on this list is secret areas. Going back to the earliest games of D&D, you had secret doors, secret passages, and so on. But it's often frustrating for game masters when they create secret zones and it's simply never discovered by players. However, I think it's really worth the time investment. In my opinion, every dungeon should have at least one area, preferably multiple areas, that players might not find. They should be fairly well concealed, but have clues pointing towards them so that an observant player can discover there's something weird going on with this room. Maybe they've been mapping carefully and they notice that there's a hole in the map that's roughly room-sized around here. So they feel like there's got to be a way in here somewhere. By giving these clues and allowing players to have that accomplishment, of discovering something that they might have genuinely missed. Uh, players feel incredibly rewarded by this. They feel smart, they feel engaged, they feel like they're an actual adventurer. When you have a dungeon where everything is designed to be found in a particular order, or nothing is really intended to be missed, then it doesn't feel as much like a real location. Number seven on this list is variety in room types. So rather than having every room just be a rough rectangular shape connected by corridors perhaps, add a lot more variety, both in verticality, so you can have very tall rooms, but also just in room shape. Have weirdly shaped rooms, um, as long as they're fairly easy to describe, or octagonal shaped rooms, circular rooms. You can have rooms that have a lot of pillars, rooms with a lot of debris, rooms with certain features that add better cover, and so on. Uh, this makes rooms much more memorable. It makes it a lot easier to map as well. Players will recognize a room that they've come to before and they'll see the possibilities in it. And they'll be able to picture ways in which this room could have been used. If everything is a series of just shoebox shaped spaces, it becomes repetitive very quickly. And it doesn't feel as much like a place that intelligent beings lived in and shaped to the purposes that they were there for. In addition to adding a lot more texture and variety to a dungeon, one fun thing that you can do is to add architectural motifs to different sections of the dungeon. This helps you define a zone that players can anchor in their head as a bunch of rooms that are all probably used for the same purpose and are close to each other. This aids a lot in navigation, because players can recognize when they've moved from one zone to another, and they can start getting a bigger grasp of the overall structure of how a particular level is laid out. Number eight is tactically useful areas in a dungeon. I'm a proponent of not having as much combat as perhaps a lot of groups have in dungeons, but I mean, it is a dungeon. There's monsters down there. Combat will probably break out eventually. And having areas of the dungeon that are useful in a fight 
can be a lot of fun if players notice them. For example, choke points are a really big part of this. So bridges are a great example, or maybe very narrow corridors where you have to crawl on your hands and knees and squeeze through. Or on the other hand, places that are easily defensible. Perhaps they're uphill within a cavern and enemies would have to go uphill to try and attack you and you could roll boulders down at them. Any features like this where players walking by notice that's a very tactically useful area. That's very defensible. If we had a combat there, I bet we could turn that to our advantage somehow and then have a fight start somewhere else and see if players can pull the enemies back to that position and use it to their advantage. Having these sorts of things just sprinkled around the dungeon makes combats a lot more dynamic and a lot more strategic than they might otherwise be. Number nine, spying opportunities. Information is the lifeblood of any D&D campaign, and that's just as true in a dungeon as it would be in the overworld. If players are going to make meaningful choices while exploring a dungeon and braving its dangers, they need to have enough information to make those choices. So you can build this into the actual structure of the dungeon itself. This can be things like portcullises, where enemies can't necessarily fight each other, but they can perhaps hear each other. You could have large rooms that are very echoey. So if enemies are talking far away, then you can still hear them perhaps down a corridor. You can have situations like one-way mirrors, where players can see what's happening on the other side, but enemies can't see back. There's lots of different ways you can build this in. Uh, speaking tubes, for example, would be another way. Basically, have ways that players can gather information in a relatively safe manner about what's going on in terms of the dangers there. This allows them to actually plan and make smart tactical moves rather than simply wandering around and stumbling into whatever danger happens to be there. All right, that was a lot of information, but if there's one big takeaway that I think you should take away from how to lay out a dungeon, it's to put your emphasis as much as possible on putting the power into the player's hands to make their own decisions. So non-linearity isn't just about not making a dungeon that's a straight line. It can go into every other aspect of a dungeon as well. It's about giving them information, empowering them to make choices, and making those choices have an impact after they make them. Hopefully you found this series of tips helpful when you are designing your own homebrewed D&D dungeons. Now, if you really want to get into depth with a lot of the theory and practice of how to design dungeons like this, I'm going to create a list down below in the description of a bunch of links to old school blogs that really get into the nitty gritty on this if you want to dive down the rabbit hole. As I mentioned at the beginning of the video, I will be doing a giveaway of Tiny Dungeon 2nd Edition, and that will go to one random subscriber to the Questing Beasts newsletter. If you are already subscribed to the newsletter, then your name is already in the running. But if you're not, head to the description below and sign up to get your name thrown in there. And even if you don't win, you're going to get a great newsletter filled with the coolest blog posts, videos, podcasts, and so on happening across the whole RPG space. It isn't even mostly about my channel. It's really just a way to keep up on cool things happening in RPGs around the world. In about a week, I will do a drawing and pick one random subscriber, and I will ship it to you no matter where you are on Earth. I'm probably going to regret that. All right, that's it for this video, everyone. Thanks for watching. See you next time.